started. So I wanted to um, welcome you all to this webinar. Uh, this is hosted by ASMV, Adult Continuing Education Martha's Vineyard. It's also sponsored by Martha's Vineyard Cultural Council and the Mass Cultural Council, who uh, support our work in getting the information out, especially for living and working on Martha's Vineyard. Um, I am Holly Bellabono. I'm the Executive Director of ASMV. Um, I've also run a business as an entrepreneur here and I'm very interested in the health and vitality of the small business community. Um, this is our second think tank. The first one a couple of weeks ago was also held online and in response to the pandemic and the situation and we wanted to focus on different themes and different think tanks and bring in different panelists each time. So our first one focused on customer and client outreach and communication. This one is focusing a little bit more on financial issues such as uh, cash flow and budgeting during these strange times. Um, please, if you have a question, I encourage you to uh, look down at the bottom of your screen. There's a Q&A button. Uh, if you have any questions, just pop it in there and we'll go through the next hour and answer. Um, you can direct it at a particular panelist or it can just be general. Um, if you have any issues seeing us or hearing us, please let us know in the chat box. Um, otherwise, we'll keep moving forward and all the panelists feel entrepreneur on the, on the island and um, <laughs> run a um, um, coffee business, Chillmark Coffee Company. Um, I believe you do both retail directly with customers as well as wholesale with vendors. So if you could please introduce yourself and describe what you do. Um, and then I wanted to ask you specifically um, how you're looking at the next three months and maybe the next six months in terms of budgeting and projecting sales and uh, your operations. Hi, hi everybody. Um, I'm Todd Christie, and um, I do run um, the Chilmark Coffee Company. Uh, I am a very small roaster uh, in the big scheme of coffee roasting. Uh, we roast uh, probably about 26 to 28,000 pounds of coffee a year. Um, uh, unfortunately, that only happens in about six months. So uh, it's a hustle. Um, I've always kind of liked that hustle. Um, I, I kind of got, um, Holly was nice to send a bunch of questions ahead of time. And um, <laughs> I, I think it's a, a universal response that none of us, at least, at least for, I'm speaking for myself, I never would have imagined it's something like where we are right now in my lifetime. Um, I, I'm sure I'm not alone. Um, as, a, as a business, um, I think that, sorry, I, I am looking at some notes, I apologize. Um, you know, one of the, one of the ideas of that forecasting, you know, revenue and cash flow out over a period of time, um, particularly like this is, is really, um, I, I just, I feel like it's such a crapshoot. Uh, I really, I really don't know. Um, you know, my shortfall, I'm, I'm projecting anywhere from 40 to 60% for the summer season. Um, and that's dependent on a couple of factors. Um, for the fall, I think that number will finish um, probably a shortfall of around 30%. Um, we lost all of our, we do, we do some catering, I do some catering with um, uh, caterers, basically. I was hired as a subcontractor to be at weddings and events. Um, all of those have been canceled. Um, uh, I took on a long time ago the idea of not taking deposits for those things because things come up and so, <laughs> kind of wish I'd taken deposits, but I feel like I probably would have had to give in all those back at this point. Um, I think that um, one of the things that um, I have a very active, you know, my wife is a very active participant in this business, um, just for brainstorming and scheming. And um, uniquely, we had um, her father-in-law was in, uh, my father-in-law was in Thailand when this all started. And um, <laughs> so we were sort of um, put in a position immediately to kind of think about uh, him coming home 
him quarantining for at least two weeks. And this was the end of January. So um, with all of that happening then, we decided as a business to um, that this could happen, that what, what has happened. And it was a total just shot in the dark. Turned out we were right, unfortunately. Um, we bought everything that we thought we might need for four months. Um, January, February, yeah. March, and April are usually our slowest months. Yeah, I mean, I, we, I lucked out in being right, but I, I wish I hadn't been. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So we, we put a lot of money out in um, the end of January and the beginning of February to buy um, bags and labels and actually um, plastic bags for doing deliveries because uh, immediately I saw that if, if we did get shut down, if, if everything was shut down, that deliveries would be sort of where it might go. And um, uh, I wasn't sure how that might work. So um, that actually worked out. Um, as soon as everything went into uh, the quarantine and stay at home, um, you know, my emails were, were nuts. And um, everyone that was here quarantining needed stuff delivered. And so um, we've been sort of actively on the down low kind of participating in that process of, of providing, you know, safe product. I mean, it's sometimes it's weird to be a drug dealer and uh, that's kind of where I am. I feel like, you know, it's, you're, you're going house to house and dropping stuff off and trying to do it, you know, safely for everybody involved, including us. And uh, um, one of the things that I thought was an interesting um, note that you sent Holly about this was um, profit versus uh, engagement. And it, mm -hmm. that's a really, that's a really interesting idea <laughs> and, and it's something i think that a lot of businesses think about all the time and and i guess um i i would kind of hope that those aren't necessarily fighting each other but that, that they work together um you hope that your profit is isn't based on your engagement and um uh, i think that you know for me as a business um of course i need to make money i mean we I think everyone does who's in a business somehow um, and I feel like the engagement is a responsibility. I mean, it's part of your community. You know, what, what, how, what else do we do? Um, I wish my profit was more, but I mean, at the same time, um, I think that those two do work together. Your profit can be sort of a part of your you know, community engagement. And, and, um, that's been an interesting, an interesting idea to think about because I'm now doing, um, I'm certainly more engaged, maybe not, um, you know, as a, as a, uh, a free thing, but engaged than I ever thought I would be with the people that live it's around an me. Interesting, um, so that's yeah, good. it's an interesting way to um, uh, think about the balance between those two, between profit and engagement. Uh, because when you're a for-profit business, obviously you're in business to make money. Um, when I was a business owner, I always uh, had the 80-20 the rule in my head that 80% uh, of my yeah. time needed to be spent in activities that directly produced a revenue. And 20% of my time could be community service, or it could be free things, or it could be just engagement, just, just to engage. Um, and I'm wondering if other business owners right now um, are looking at what's happening and kind of swapping that, kind of flipping it, that, that 80% of my time needs to be engagement, reaching out, connecting with people, making people aware, uh, checking in with people, whereas only maybe 20 is going to be active revenue making and profit making. I'm curious if uh, anyone else has thought about things like that in those terms. Holly, uh, to, to your question, I believe that a lot of our island businesses have been doing a lot more engagements. Like you, um, you see businesses like the Ritz. Obviously, there is no income being generated at their sing-alongs that they do. However, they're doing it as to keep their customer base still engaged, to let them know we're still here. We just will get over this. Come back to us. Um, you see business owners um, and realtors who have started their talk shows, uh, and I find them very creative, and, and, and I'm loving the fact that they're all doing that. Um, I think to Todd's point, yes, engagement is extremely important this time. You know, in economics, whenever we're looking at the supply and demand, pricing is usually the factor and how it affects our um, 
you know, earnings and everything else in the economy. But in this case, it's not, it has nothing to do with the usual supply and demand. This is a, during a pandemic where most of the businesses are told to stay at home, not to do anything, not to do any engaging. Not everyone has the capabilities of, uh, you know, if you're a hotel, you cannot possibly go and deliver the room and the experience yeah. at someone's house. Um, so obviously a lot has changed, but thankfully um, I'm extremely uh, lucky and I feel very pleased to live in an environment, the vineyard, where a lot of our businesses have been extremely creative in how to make past this pandemic and how to get stronger when they're able to open on uh, May 18th. Yeah, it's a good point about it. The place where we're at is not due to supply and demand changes. <laughs> on the contrary, there's a lot of demand and there's plenty of supply and it's uh, political and health, public health reasons that we can't mix those two together, um, which is creating a huge challenge. Um, Samantha, I wanted to ask you about the, um, it, it, we're thinking about in terms of product getting product out to a customer. Um, what about service? Because I know that you're a consultant. Um, Samantha is the founder and president of Enlightened Marketing. Do you wanna tell us a little bit about what you do and especially your thoughts for um, service provision during this time? Um, we're talking mostly with small businesses on the island, but I know that you work nationally and internationally. Um, so I wanted to get your perspective a little bit about um, during this time, is it, should small businesses be thinking about expanding off island, thinking about shifting their market in some ways or diving down into focusing on what they currently do locally? Um, I think it's always been, you know, something that's really special about the vineyard is to have local island businesses working for uh, uh, on island with the island businesses. You know, I, I think we all appreciate that community aspect. Uh, and there's definitely um, a cachet and a, a preference, you know, uh, shop local first and those kinds of things. And I think that does um, uh, transfer over to service businesses. One of the things that I'm, I'm just off uh, some with clients uh, this morning and you know, the top that keep coming up are resilience and um, sustainability and the opportunities that this kind of a crisis bring to all different kinds of businesses. What's, what to me is a shame is that right before this, I think in 2019, we were seeing a peak in um, businesses that delivered an experience. So uh, some of the top funded uh, offers on Shark Tank, for example, were like corn mazes and haunted houses and other, you know, these elite travel experiences. Uh, and I think that it's a shame that we're not able to do that right now. And because a lot of those kinds of businesses won't be able to weather this uh, and come out the other side. And I, the reason I say that's a shame is I do think that experiential businesses uh, are so much uh, so relevant in the 21st century that we're really looking for a deep personal experiences at the same time i think for for product and service businesses it's like what are the things that we what are the things that we can take away from this it's it's a huge constraint put upon businesses and so what can we do to get to the other side of it what i'm seeing a lot with my clients is more obviously remote work but that wasn't something that everyone did especially for uh, my clients who are larger size clients like they their clients i work with consultants mostly and their clients are global multinational and they're not used to uh, not seeing a consultant in person. They're not used to having that workforce being remote. So there is a lot of adapting to the situation and that being brand new. Uh, you know, just the idea of doing Zooms, I think we've seen has been in the last 60 days, this is, there's just been this surge in doing Zoom or WebEx calls and that that's a brand new idea. And for, uh, for me, I've been working remotely for you know, 15 years. And I, I think what we, we can all, those of us who are um, uh, technology forward can take those aspects of our work and support others in the community with them. C uh, can we help others 
to uh, you know, create the Shopify site or, or whatever uh, needs to happen with that? How can we support others in connecting with their audience on social media? So as a service, I would look at what are the ways that uh, you can make yourself even more um, relevant right now to your clients. And some of the things that I think are really important are making sure that your message is updated for what's going on right now. Um, building in terminology like sustainable, resilient, those relevant, those kinds of words are, um, are speaking to what, how people are feeling without having to constantly say pandemic, pandemic. Uh, every business needs to be sustainable long term. Every business does need to have resilient, uh, be, to be resilient and to build that in as part of the business model. Uh, speaking to getting results, a lot of uh, service businesses are you know, built on a longer term horizon. And right now people need to see results, uh, more immediate results. It's funny because a lot of larger businesses are still investing in these kind of three year arcs, but not every business can afford that kind of timeline. Uh, very targeted, timely offers. What, what is the problem they're having right now? And what can you do to help them solve a problem that is right now? So is it a technology pro problem? Is it that uh, they don't know how to manage remotely because they've never had to do that? Is it um, you know, something else that you know how to solve that, uh, that they don't know how to? And obviously that means talking to them. So I have seen a lot of surveys from local island businesses, which I love. I think we have a lot of really good marketers on island. So I've seen services saying, what do you need from us? Uh, when would you feel safe going back to the Y, to the film center, to um, a restaurant? Uh, staying in touch with how people are feeling is also a way that you can say, oh, well, that gives me an idea about how I could uh, offer a solution to that. Excellent. Um, thank you. I'm going to pause the recording for a second and just see if that affects the video at all. All right, so we're recording again. I don't know if that's gonna help us or not. Um, I think it's just a Zoom issue that, that we're all frozen. <laughs> but the sound is coming through loud and clear. So. Um, so Samantha, that was a good point about timeline and, and focusing, narrowing in on exactly what's timely right now. Norm, I wanted to ask you, um, Norman Worthwine is an ACE MV board member. He's also a CPA and is a uh, former CFO for Tiffany and Avon, some pretty large corporations. Uh, he serves as our treasurer now and has been very helpful. Uh, Norm, what do you, uh, following on what Samantha said about timeliness and timelines, and also what uh, Todd mentioned about he's thinking three months out, six months out, what would you say to small business owners about how to think about their budgets and their cash flow and forecasting? Should people be thinking 30 days? I, I really need to do this and see this, you know, three months. Should they be thinking through December? What would you suggest? Yeah, Holly, I, I, I think at this stage, knowing, knowing what the impact has been and could be, uh, certainly uh, it, it's, it's, it's a part Sorry, Norm. Hold on. Yeah, I'm holding on. Okay. Okay, sorry. So anyway, okay. I, I think right now is it, it, almost necessary for, for the businesses, for, for people who are in business to sit down and, and, and do a cash flow forecast. And that forecast would certainly reach out the next three or four months and in light of the situation with seasonality, I think you even want to go past the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the summer or the season into next winter and, and looking at the, the numbers. So I think the start is take a look at your prior year return, your, your re results, both revenue and your profitability. And it may sound a little dramatic, but I think the strategy for this, for many of you, would quite frankly be survival. So in light of that, uh, the first thing is take a look at your revenue and whether you're a service business or a, a product business, retail, wholesale, take a look at what your volume was and make some estimate going into this summer and next winter 
as to what, what, what your volume is going to look like. And I think it's fair to say that you're going to have to be doing significant uh, reductions to that revenue volume and, and do it realistically. I think the next step when you do that is you want to look at your costs uh, and then you want to break those costs down into two elements, fixed costs, in other words, your rent, utilities, insurance, those kind, and then also your variable, in other words, expenses that uh, aren't relatively fixed that, that vary. And uh, with your variable expenses, really get down to what's necessary. So you can, you can pare back your expense basis to really what's necessary to cover your, fi your fixed cost. The other things that you can do, uh, you know, depending on uh, uh, your, your business, but uh, I think it's time you, you could look at, for instance, uh, how you, how you uh, recover your sales. Is it through credit card? Is it however you, do you bill clients? But you want to put a focus with what we're faced on, I believe, in, uh, in collecting your, your revenue immediately in some way. Um, just try to tr try to enhance collection of your sales or your service revenue in, in any ways you can. And in this stage of the game, you maybe want to think about offering uh, discounts to, to get paid sooner uh, so that you can bring the cash in sooner and quickly. Uh, the other thing is if you're, uh, if you're in, the, in the retail business or you have inventory, you really want to manage your inventory very tightly. You want to make sure you can supply or, or serve your customers, but you, you really don't want to be building inventory, which is cash out. And if your sales are down, it's going to create uh, somewhat of a cash crunch for you. So very carefully managing your inventory. Uh, you know, the old, I guess, Japanese strategy of kind of uh, on time, if that's possible. You maybe even want to try to work with your vendors uh, with regard to terms on pricing and and, and timing for payment, anything you can do to preserve your cash and not have it sitting idly uh, around. And then the other thing, the last thing that I would say you want to look at, many of you may not have it, but you certainly, I think in these times, uh, you, you really want to almost reduce or eliminate any unnecessary capital expenses. So if you were thinking of expansion, if you were thinking of doing some remodeling, if it wasn't necessary, you're probably best off uh, deferring that, at least for now, uh, because as I said, I think, I think your key strategy going through this summer and then going into the downturn in the winter is preserving uh, your cash position as best you can. And uh, hopefully as we come out of this next spring, uh, you can get back on a strategy of growth and perhaps better profitability. But Again, I think those are just some, some key things to look at realistically. And again, not to sound too negative, but I think if you, if, you, if you think of what I need to do from a cash perspective to survive this, this period is going to help you make some decisions. And it's obviously very unusual, abnormal time, but it, it, it's, it, I think it's a necessary thing and a necessary strategy at this time, Holly. Um, yeah, I totally agree with the idea of keeping your cash close. And I wanted to highlight what you said about inventory. I know when I was running a retail business, um, I found that you could order things in bulk and get discounts. If you ordered earlier in the season, it might be more cost efficient than ordering in August, um, especially with delays in shipping. And just ordering early and ordering a lot tended to be something that would save a small business money. So in these times, with so much uncertainty and so many events being canceled, the average retail small business is looking at how to order inventory in a very cost-effective way. Um, so I guess I'm, I, what you just said struck me as that might be something that a small business owner needs to shift is how they make those purchases. Do they purchase in bulk or do they spend a little extra money and purchase in small segments? Um, do they not buy everything they need at the beginning of the season and instead wait till mid season or even, even late season to see if they need to replenish their stock? Any other thoughts on that? 
Todd, I, I bet that that's something you have to grapple with because you have to purchase your beans before you can roast them and you don't know what kind of supply as well as cups and uh, spoons and ancillary yeah. items that go along with your retail business, correct? Yeah, am I on? Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, I usually, you know, a pallet is uh, 1,200 pounds. So, you know, if you take 26,000 pounds and divide it by 1,200, that's how many pallets I need a season. And um, so it, it turns out to be quite a bit. Um, that usually shows up every week. And so um, I, don't get, I don't get a discount other than I can fill a pallet at the same cost as one bag on a pallet is the same as 12 bags on a pallet. Um, but, okay. um, so far that that supply chain with with that with those suppliers that I work with um, appears to be sound um, i'm I'm more you know I'm more uh, thinking about like bags and labels and ties and and all of these other little things that are not made domestically so I think that that's that's something that you know I tried to plan ahead but um, you know those are the, the cost is prohibitive of, of having too much of that in stock at a, at a time. I just can't, I don't have that cash flow anyway. So um, I, I'm not as, I'm not totally as needed, but yeah, it is, I think it's, a, it's going to be a challenge for any small business that is now had, you know, almost eight weeks sitting idle at least. I mean, if they were even open in January and February, um, that cash flow is, is that's gone. So getting getting all that back rolling again is going to be a, a real challenge and i think that that's you know where um grants um hopefully there's some grants available to small businesses um through the state um that can come through our towns as well um, block grants um and those those aren't being unfortunately those aren't being very well advertised and so um it's it's just it's just a, it's kind of chaos. It's kind of a free for all for that kind of stuff. And um, I think it'd be interesting to figure out for small businesses um, how to become more economic with what we buy, how we buy. Um, you know, it's and and also try and figure out the, the getting back into getting back open to get a cash flow to get all of the things moving. I, I don't know. I mean, you know, I'll go I'll go into debt to do it, but to a limit. Thank you, Todd. Well, uh, uh, Dion, one thing, yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Tilma. Uh, the one thing that I wanted to point out is um, I've seen in the Edgertown area specifically, um, as part of our Edgertown Board of Trade Initiative, we have a Facebook page specifically set for members. And a lot of our business owners have shared their ideas or their supplies or where they're finding certain ways of making, um, you know, obviously there will be different needs during when business is open, such as masks, gloves, and uh, sanitary sure. products. And a lot of them have shared the information with the rest of the group. I am sure certain businesses are working together so that they can share the cost. Um, you know, maybe you do not need 500 masks or you cannot um, afford 500 masks all at once. However, um, you know, between three, four businesses, maybe you can share the cost and get the better pricing as well. Yeah. Uh, I, and I think the working together between businesses has been very admirable. Yeah, I would I would reiterate that that's going to be a big, a big thing for particularly businesses that are in direct relationship with the public. Um, if if they all can, you know, commingle orders of PPE or or whatever it is they're looking for, hand sanitizer, face masks. I mean, that's going to be a huge cost savings in the end. Um, if the, and if the towns can help facilitate that, I'm not sure at what level, but. Um, you know that that then again there's more savings which can be you know put out it's a really good point definitely and i just wanted to remind everyone that yes the video is poor quality through zoom right now i'm not sure why but um hopefully you'll stick with us and uh 
uh, deal with the frozen nature of it. It's, it's not ideal, but that's what we've got right now for some reason. Uh, Dion, I wanted to welcome you to the webinar. Hello, can Hi. you hear me? Hi. Hi, Norm. Glad you could Hi, make it. Yeah, good. So I've been, I, I wasn't able to get on, but I've been listening since two o'clock and, and I, 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 I sort of figured it out how to download the app onto my iPad. And, and so I've been listening on. Yes. Okay. So okay, well, welcome. So Thank will you, you uh, introduce yourself to folks and let them know what you do. And I wanted to specifically talk with you with what we were talking about with Todd. A second ago is uh, inventory and cash flow and what's your strategy for looking at the summer and the fall as far as um, making purchases or making any sort of expenditures. Yeah, so I'm Dion Thomas, Chef Dion. I'm over here at the VFW and, um, and my contingency plan <laughs> is uh, over, uh, after the season last year, usually what I do because I've noticed that the, month, the winter months are tough. So while cash flow was good, the season ended, I sort of make a deal with my suppliers that they'll, sup, uh, I'll, I'll get a cheaper rate during the winter months. And, um, and so that was good. Well, here comes COVID-19 and, and, and they ran low as well and wasn't able to come through to keep me at that price. I couldn't get a lot of the products that I needed in the restaurant. And my, so my saving grace was, so I partner with Elio, and Elio has a truck that goes off uh, every week for his store. So I was able to ask Elio to buy stuff for me, and he, since he buys in bulk, so I was able to get my supplies at a cheaper rate to continue doing what I'm doing in the restaurant. And, and, um, and so I do take out. Um, it's, not, it's not overly busy. But, you know, I come in each day and I, I just sit here like now until and I come at 12, I leave at 7 and whatever comes in, comes in. Well, I've lost most of my, I've lost all of my bookings, over 35 bookings that I had. And I was listening to Todd when Todd said um, he um, really accepts uh, uh, deposits. And, but, you know, over the years, I've learned, and that was my mantra years ago until I said, you know what, I better start taking deposits. Well, I had to refund all the deposits. The last $3,000 I sent to the congresswoman who I had a party last week, um, and they asked for it. And, you know, so that's it. So my coffer is actually empty now. So I'm, I'm running on just fumes. But as the season progresses, um, we hope that this thing would, you know, this uh, governor would make a, 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 the decision to lift this lockdown so we can all get back to work and get us out of the weeds. So for the summer, I'm here just doing, there's, I'm just playing it by ear. I remember Elio saying to me and my wife saying to me, well, Dion, what do you have in your hands? And I said, well, there's a few products that I was peddling and I had license and so forth by the state. So I said, you know, I have, I have, I have a lot of materials downstairs, a lot of bottles and labels and caps and so forth that I bought. And, you know, I was really looking for a production kitchen over the years, you know, because uh, one thing the state uh, inspector said to me, I cannot be either I'm a manufacturer or I'm a restaurant, but I can be both at the same time when they came to inspect my facility. And so I was looking for a production kitchen. So that was in the works. Again, we were targeting our, our southern uh, uh, property down there in Anguilla, which we wanted to go back and say, okay, man, I have the rest, I have the property. It's been shuttered for 10 years. Let's go back and reopen this restaurant and give it a fresh coat of paint. Well, I toyed with that idea in in la, late fall and said I would make my trip down to the islands in January and I have some money and I'm going to go and, you know, get this restaurant open to sort of narrow, to, to, to sort of balance the scale. Well, I, thank God I didn't do that because going south to do a, a venture is, is costly. 
and so you know so on there's nothing really now on the on the agenda more than trying to do my products out of here and and buying as much local stuff as i possibly can you know the local products that's on the shelf so that's where i'm at right now what you said about uh when elio and your wife asked you what do you have in your hands that struck me because it reminds me of what samantha said just a few minutes ago what what's timely what can you what problems can you solve right now and yeah. that's a key thing that so, i think so, of, of business right so so my sauces i started making my sauces again and i, I bought maybe about 12 cases of of, of different brands that I different things that I, I came up with over the years and that's what I'm, I spend my time doing and you know and hopefully I can get it on the internet I can get it in the stores because there's there's no restaurant there's no staff the little that I'm doing now it's you know usually this time of the year of course with everyone usually this time of the year all my the eight staff they're here and we're but no one's just being by myself in the in the business so I'm whatever I have in my hands I'm just that's what I'm using I'm doing. So Tilma and Norm, this brings me to a thought. Um, in addition to thinking, what do I have in my hands? What can I address in the moment? What problems can I solve in a timely manner right now? You also have to think, well, how am I going to survive down the road three months, six months from now? Uh, which brings me to the question of how do a, how would a small business know when it's time to take out a loan, for instance, or when it's time to completely shift your mode of operation? Uh, what sort of signs should a business be looking for? Is there a percentage of sales? I've gone down 10% or I've gone down 50%. Or is there another trigger point that a small business owner can look at and say, okay, now I know that this needs to change and I need to do something else. Holly, Holly I would say... Go on, Tilma. Mine is a joke, Nerv, so I'll let you answer the question, but I was going to say you always take a loan out when you need it the least. <laughs> you, not when you need it the most. You need, your sales need to still be good. Your, you still need to be in the rising. You always need to make sure that you're at, still at a good standing so that your credit worthiness is still okay for a bank to extend credit. But I'll let Norm take this one. Yeah. Tilma, this is, let, let, let me throw a little to you, Tilma. I, I, I would agree with what Tilma's saying, Holly, that uh, as, as, you, as things get desperate, it's not the best time to be uh, looking for a loan, unfortunately. Uh, however, uh, Tilma, question for you. Other than the CARES Act and the PPP that the government has dealt with, what's, what do you, are you familiar with what the uh, Small Business Administration, have they changed or have they adjusted strategy with regard to uh, business loans in, in, in this environment? Um, for the most part, Norm, um, in business uh, under business credit loan underwriting, the, the way that we underwrite loans is a little more different than what we normally would do for an individual. Uh, on the individual side, you still want to make sure that their, the payroll checks are still coming in. You need to make sure that they're still employed, that that income is still flowing in uh, to make sure that they can refinance their mortgage or get a home equity line of credit. Surprisingly, that hasn't changed even with a lot of bus uh, business owners being furloughed um, or furloughing their employees for them to collect unemployment temporarily. Um, on the business side, majority of the numbers are usually based on uh, the sales that a business had in the prep prior years, year to date. So a lot of the businesses knowing that they were going to go through some difficult times, started the process with their respective banks, um, whether it's Cape Cod Five or MV Bank or Rockland Trust, uh, they reached out immediately to their bank and asked about lines of credit way before the SBA um, came up with the EIDL, which is the Disaster Recovery Loan or the Paycheck Protection Loan, the PPP. Um, there isn't much underwriting changes going on. Uh, I think that majority of us are all, um, I mean, little tweaks 
here and there, but not, not that significant. But I think major for the most part, everyone is hopeful that businesses are resilient and going forward, they will make up for the sales. And we're all hoping that everyone has a little bit of an itch, whether it is going away on vacation or going in a restaurant and having food or just going on a shopping spree. So uh, with all that in mind, we, you know, uh, there is a lot of positive thinking, uh, hoping that things will recover as soon as possible right after this is over or there is some sort of cure. I mean, obviously we'll, to some extent, we'll all be scared a little bit from this experience, but um, hopefully we'll all come out of this stronger. And but Holly, to answer your question with regards to when a business should apply for a loan, uh, where their when their sales are in decline, um, I would highly recommend the sooner the, the later. I wouldn't wait until you uh, have no coming back or when your bills that are unpaid are way beyond you can re recuperate or that you can show income coming in. So. If I were to give an advice to all businesses, if you are feeling a constraint right now with regard to sales, or you feel going into this season, uh, even with the doors of your businesses open, reach out to your bankers. Um, I know they would all love to hear from you. Some of us have closed our lobbies, but we're still working and we would still love a call. Holly, the, Holly okay. and some of the, the other yeah. person for many small businesses to consider is that they may not have been uh, up till date in, in, in a, a position of having uh, loans outstanding or debt, but uh, if the business and even personally, if they have some, some level of substantial assets, uh, you know, even though they haven't borrowed in the past, uh, and Tilma, you can jump in after this, but uh, you know, with some kind of security, they, they, they may want to reach out uh, to, to borrow and, and using their assets as security. And uh, I think Tilma would agree, generally, if there's security uh, behind it, the, 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 the loan process would be uh, a, a little more straightforward and positive. So even, you, even if you own a business and you have private property in these times, you may want to use your, your, your assets to secure a, a loan which will protect some cash flow. I, but, I agree, but Norm. Again, Sorry, yeah. collateral across the board is, 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 is preferred, rather. Um, obviously, they're for smaller business, not by the terminology used by Small Business Banking Association, rather than small business, your mom and pop shop, um, or um, someone like Todd or someone who is operating in, in a smaller capacity than what's considered a small business by the SBA. There are other options as, um, you know, a line of, a personal line of credit, if they have um, um, a property that they can collect, uh, get a home equity line of credit, that's usually the um, individual loans are usually the, the cheapest way of getting money out versus uh, through the business. Uh, however, prime rates are significantly low right now, which uh, gives the business lending um, a lot of credibility with the rates and a lot of people um, are finding those rates to be very attractive right now. Um, um, I know business credit cards, personal credit cards, some that have extended timeframes of 0% uh, interest uh, rates or anything of the sort. Um, but as, as Norm said, if you have collateral, even if it's a car that you don't own anything on it or um, the machinery that you have in your kitchen or that you're baking the, the coffee beans or anything that of that sort would give the bank some sort of collateral, making the process a little bit easier um, in the underwriting. Um, I think I, I'm not certain on the underwriting process of MV Bank, um, I know that um, Cape Cod 5 is very easy to work on smaller loans, uh, like up to 100,000 or so. Uh, the bank I work for, uh, up to 50,000, we do not require documentation, kind of making it as easier as possible on the smaller businesses with smaller needs on lines of credit and, and 
and loans. Dion, did you want to jump in there with something? I thought I heard you for well, a it's, it's just a, It's just something that Norm said that sort of got me um, thinking. And, and, and this is in reference now, not, 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 not to the food um, um, industry, but to retail, I mean, clothing. I mean, we know, we know that a lot of the small businesses here on the island, you know, that peddles our t-shirts and so forth, we don't, we don't, they're not, they're not property owners, you know, and, they, and, and who is going out to buy a dress when you can't go anywhere, or who is going out to buy t-shirts when you can't, you see what I'm saying? How, how does that affect, how, 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 how does that, their bottom line is, okay, nothing is coming in, I'm going to go out, and I'm going to, you know, I can afford it, and I'm going to get a, a loan to float my business, but the, the said business is not going to generate anything to sort of take care of the, the note at the end of the month. Um, it, you know, so is it, is it, I don't know. It's just, it's just all those thoughts going in my head. You know, what do you, you know, are you getting, are you, are you say getting a loan to take care of your immediate needs or to take care of the business when there's no, there's actually no business. So where do you draw so the line? Where do you say it? So hopefully Dion, um, no banks, and I know for a fact, no banks on Island would extend credit to a business that is unable to pay back. I, I can guarantee you of that. Um, um, all the banks on Island are, are very credible and they have a very high level of ethics. Um, with regards to how to pay back the loan, uh, normally what I would suggest under this cir circumstances would be uh, lines of credit to give the businesses that cash flow and liquidity that they need temporarily. Um, I wouldn't ever suggest yeah. to someone getting a hundred thousand dollar in loan, spending it all today, and then never having the ability to mm -hmm. pay back. The idea is pay. Uh, say you couldn't make rent today, but you know that you will be able to make it in a month for both months covered and you can pay it back down. The idea is to use the cash flow that the loan or line of credit gives you to help during this time that, that's going on. You know, where Norm started earlier, he was helping out everyone explaining how we should identify the costs that we have, then divide them on fixed cost and variable cost and Let's say you're buying your merchandise, you're buying all your clothing, you were closed for two months, you didn't have any income coming in yet, your fixed costs remain there. You still have to pay your rent, your electricity bill and everything else that you had going on. So when you get that inventory that for the dresses and the clothing and the shoes that this retail stores are going to need to buy, you can use a line of credit because as you're selling those dresses and shoes and everything else, you have the ability to pay down. So I wouldn't necessarily look at the loan as a handout that could hurt you down the road. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, let's see, someone just asked, line of credit must be paid back in one year. Are we going to do enough business to pay back in one year? Um, Not all lines of credit are required to be paid on one year. Ask your bankers. There are certain um, loans that are below 100000 depending on the relationship you have with your bank, that do not require to be paid down within a year. Um, again, highly recommend if you contact your, um, your bank. Yeah, tell, tell me the other thing is, if, if, if fortunately, I shouldn't say fortunately, if, if the business or the person had substantial or, or had collateral, and we go back to that, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a short-term line of credit. You, you could get a term loan, which will enable yeah. you to spread out the repayment as you recover. So, you know, a, a generally a line of credit, uh, it does require payback, but it may not be one year. But if you can secure a loan in some way, you probably can negotiate uh, a term of, of five, maybe even more years, which will enable you to rebuild the business and then recover cash that, that you're losing in this time. 
So yeah. um, probably the, the best thing is if, if you're thinking of a loan, quite frankly, and I think Tilma would agree is talk to your banker, you know, go through, they can go through what you have, your assets, what your needs are, and come up with a strategy of how to help you. But uh, it, it, it's, it, the needs time is complicated, but uh, sit down with your banker and go through what your needs are. And, and I, you know, I've worked with most of the banks and uh, especially on the island, they're very concerned and, and supportive of the local business and really reach out as much as they can to help. But, uh, you know, if you're really looking like you're gonna be in trouble from cash flow, talk, talk to your banker. So Todd, you have your hand up? Yeah, I, this is, I mean, these are um, really good. I mean, it's really good information. And, and I would say that, you know, three years ago, uh, I did the same thing. I, we went to my bank and I said, you know, I have a business that generates this much income. You know, how much, how much line of credit basically can I get on my business? And the bank broke it down into, you have, you know, a home, uh, you know, property that's worth this and a business that's worth this and we'll give you so much on this. We'd, we'd rather do it on the business alone. So we have a line of credit based on my business. And, uh, you know, you, I think that over three or four years that we've had it, we, we learned, you know, it's a little trial and error. But the first year we had it, we used like the whole thing up in a month. I don't even know what I was thinking. I mean, we bought as much as we could and sort of stored it and stocked it. And, and then, you know, uh, September rolls around and you start to panic because you're like, I've got $50,000 I have to pay off that I haven't been paying off all season. And um, it, it, it's great. But just remember that that also can create an enormous amount of stress um, later in the season if, if you're not really very... Uh, I'm, I'm not a great business person, but I, I, I'm learning over time. And so now when I, when I use that or when I access that money, you know, it, it may be up to $4,000, you know, at a time, like I need to buy a pallet. I don't have it available right now. I'm going to, I'm going to have that money available to me to buy just one order, just to, just to get me going. And, and that has been a better strategy. The money's still there and it's still available. But just remember that you can you can get yourself into like a pretty pretty big hole quickly if you're not a responsible purchaser like I didn't I didn't used to be. <laughs> <laughs> and that that's Tough a great to point, Todd. That that's absolutely a great point. Um, I think a lot of um, you know going through the SBA process for the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, I was always very mindful of the fact that none of our customers are bankers by, by trade. So they had, whenever they had to fill these documents and provide with all the 940s and 941s or 1099s or whatever their business was, it was always a great reminder to know that it's like me baking coffee beans right now. I wouldn't <laughs> even know what to do first. Yeah. So um, 100%, I agree with, with you. That's a very fair point. And and I will say normally the very first question um, of when you apply for a loan, usually the very first question is, um, would you ever be able to pay that within the first year? And the reason to that question, even though it's not mandatory in certain cases, is the, they want to make sure that your sales and the income sure. and the cash flow is high enough where it can satisfy the payments if the need be. Sure. So I want to move on to one last question because we only have a few minutes left. Um, the idea of a contingency plan. Uh, we've mentioned that briefly here and there. Um, it could be as formal as a written Excel spreadsheet contingency plan, or it could be just a thought in the back of your head that if then this, that. Um, but I wanted to specifically address Dion and Todd and Samantha and say um, we've all had to pivot to use the word of the day right uh, recently and most likely we're going to have to pivot again this summer and then maybe even a second or third time this fall 
maybe again this winter. So it's not just that we did it once and now we're in one place, but we're likely going to have to continue shifting and transitioning multiple times to get our businesses through the coming year. Um, and I wanted to see if any of you had any ideas or insights into how to draw up a contingency plan, how to think about it, how to um, come up with ideas, how to think about what's in your back pocket, so to speak, because we talked a minute ago about what's in your hands now. The idea of a contingency plan is what's in your back pocket just in case. So Todd, Dion, Samantha, any ideas? As I said, my, yeah, my I mean, contingency, oh, sorry, Todd, you go ahead. <laughs> no, no, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, so my contingency plan, as I say, you know, what's in my hands? And I've noticed, I've, 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 you know, if, if the restaurant doesn't, if putting foods on the, on the, I mean, everyone has to eat. And, you know, God bless the folks who have been coming and supporting me. And, um, and I, up to this point before COVID, before COVID struck, I was not on social media. I wasn't socially savvy. You know, I would say, you know, I just don't waste my time going on Instagram and Facebook and stuff like that. Well, these last eight weeks have taught me something. Now I'm, I'm on there, I'm, I'm feeling it out. I, I, you know, I get a few gigs in New York and through where I'm, you know, where I'm cooking for, I'm cooking for classes, online teaching kids in the inner city uh, uh, in Harlem how to make stuff, one pot meals. So that sort of, uh, you know, so I have little things that I'm doing that I would uh, I would never thought, but you know, but all these people that have done stuff for this, they reached out to me and said, Dion, do you want to be a part of it? So, and so that got me thinking and, and, and the more I do it, the more videos that I make, I realize that, you know what, if the restaurant doesn't go for, um, forward in full force this summer, you know, this is something that, this is my backup plan to move, to keep food on the table and, you know, get me through the dark months. So that's it for me. Samantha, yeah, any I mean, thoughts on that? Uh, I, I do. So I think a lot of us um, as business owners, uh, this has forced us to do something. And so in this kind of cauldron, we're like, here's some ideas that we're having. Um, and to me, a contingency plan is about finding uh, an opportunity that isn't, you know, last minute panic to come up with ideas. Uh, the because we're used to doing things or because we have ideas about how things are done, we tend to do, you know, stay within some very specific constraints. So when you're doing a contingency plan, and now is a great time to do that, what I would do is I would call, you know, three or four um, people who can advise you because they're going to see your business without all of the blinders that we all see our, our businesses with. So it's like if my contingency plan is a, I, I do service A, and if that doesn't go through, I'll do service B, which is basically service A with a few differences. Um, if you bring in somebody else, they can be like, well, have you ever thought about this? And it's like, well, that's, that's not just not on my mountain, that's two valleys over. So I really like the idea of, um, of bringing in this, you know, we would call it back in at corporate, we would call this a cross-functional business team. And, you know, you just get these um, perspectives from people who you would never think of. But what uh, I think is really amazing is we have access to this and people are, you know, I don't think people are home and doing nothing, but people are more accessible right now because of uh, not having as much travel. For, for most of my clients, the difference isn't that they're working less, it's that they're traveling less. And so there is a little more availability. And I think everybody um, feeling uh, compassionate about this and they would love to do this. I, I, I feel like everyone on the panel, you could contact any of us through Facebook or Islanders Talk or whatever uh, medium seems easiest. And now that uh, Chef Dion is on Instagram, um, you know, just reach <laughs> out to someone and say, would you brainstorm with me for 30 minutes? And can I get a couple of other um, <laughs> buddies to do that with me? Let's do it because there's, because people have ideas that you've never thought of. And I think that's, to me, it's the, the lightest version of a contingency plan rather than, you know, if it all goes to hell in a handbasket, what will we do? Nobody wants to come up with creative answers in that situation. Good point. That's a great idea for collaboration and the whole mastermind group idea of, of uh, interactive thought and uh, everybody pitching in for the benefit of our local community. Um, hey, I, so we're a little bit past three, and I feel like we should go ahead and um, and 
uh, say goodbye at this point. Uh, thank you all for joining us on this think tank. It's been a pleasure having you all here. I really appreciate your time. And uh, this has been recorded. It's going to be posted on the ASMV website. And uh, if anyone has any questions, um, you can send them to ASMV and we'll try to get them answered by these wonderful panelists. And we will be scheduling another one uh, in two to three weeks and we'll let you know about that one. And I hope you all can join us. So thank you so much and take care, everyone. Thanks for having me.